welcome back to the Icono Class Music Podcast. This is Greg Mara, and uh, man, I'm so stoked to be back. It's been a year. I think June of 2020 was the last episode I did, and uh, man, it's time. I had a job there for a minute where I was working, working with some. I actually got a chance to work with some big names, but um, that when that project ended, I was kind of figuring out what my next move is, and I feel like I really missed the podcasting. Um, I've listened to a lot of podcasts myself. It's kind of like a daily ritual in the morning when I'm getting ready. I'll, I'll put somebody on, no matter who it is. Um, so now that I'm back, I actually have a, a guest co-host who I'm hoping is going to do a ton of episodes with me. Uh, kind of a kindred spirit. I'm going to read his credits here real quick. He, uh, let's go, let me just read it. I'm just going to straight read this. He has performed and or recorded with Cliff Williams from ACDC, Simon Phillips from Toto, Jeff Beck, The Who, Mike Mangini from Steve Vai and Dream Theater and Extreme, Simon Kirk from Bad Company, Gigi Gonaway from Mariah Carey, Stu Ham, uh, Joe Satriani, bass legend, Steve Vai, um, ex-member, he was an ex-member of Steelheart, which I knew that, uh, and that's very cool, founder and co-owner of Strap, Tight Strap Locks, he's currently in his uh, band The Royal Rebels, which is a, a rock band with vocals and, um, you know, I'm going to say this about him. He was a, a former, you know, a guest of my show and there's so much more. That's, that's a credit list. There's just so much more than that. So what I'm going to do now is bring him on. Everyone welcome my co-host, Bill Lanero. Hey, Amen. So good to see you, dude. Uh- yeah, dude, it's, it's great to see you too. I think I'm chopping my head off. We're <laughs> we're actually looking at each other on FaceTime here. There we go. And uh, and oh, and then we're recording on audio. Uh, so, you know, I eventually want to take this into a way where we can, you know, we'll have it be video and we'll we'll send it up on YouTube. Uh, right now, it's a podcast form, so it's all audio. And you know, but uh, dude, so happy to have you here, man. Yeah, I mean, it's good to be back on here. You know, it's it's like you said, it's been a year since your last one. And uh, that, you yeah. know, obviously COVID and everything like that. But, the, you know, it must have been hard to kind of put down uh, the podcast mic, right? You know what it was, Bill? It was, I, I, like I said before, I got a job working at a company, which I'm not going to name. Um, but I got to work with some really big players. Rudy Sarzo. I did quite a bit of work with Rudy. Just just me and him making videos, making, uh, you know, we did some concert stuff. I got to work with uh, uh, Vinny Apice of uh, Dio fame, drummer. Um, there were some other folks, Chaz West, uh, those guys in Westbound. I mean, it, it just was a really great experience. And it was a type of thing where I've only done my video business on my own. And I... You know, I don't have to answer anybody but the client. I hate to say it like that, but I feel like it's art. So, you know, it's my it's my vision when I create something, and um, and I'm I'm probably my worst critic. So, working for someone was a little tricky because you got to throw all that out the window. You can't say, "Well, it's my artistic vision." That's what I said. (laughs) And I think I think half the time it it was cool, and half the time they didn't like the fact that I was saying it was my artistic vision, but. Nonetheless, when the project was over, um, you know, I was able to concentrate on, you know, things I wanted to do, you know, and I, and for years I'd been doing product demos for, for, you know, tons of companies. And, you know, I pulled that back and I got back into writing my record and I'm doing a documentary on Prairie Sun, which you and I will talk about. Absolutely. But let's jump back over to you. I mean, you know, we met at uh, the G4 event in 2017, which was Warren Martini, Paul Gilbert. Uh, Joe Satriani, Tommy Emanuel, uh, who else? Phil Collin. I mean, there were other amazing players there. But I remember that's where I met you. You were just sort of this dude walking around with a hoodie on and the bulk, you know, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the beanie pulled down, you know, real close to your eyes with a camera. And I'm going, you know, I had some pretty badass, you know, backstage access because we were also helping with Backline because I was working for the pop-up store Bananas at Large as you did you know and really we didn't even talk to each other for the for for the entire event except for the last i think day or two yeah exactly. and i really wish we had because we have a lot in common yeah it's kind of crazy right i mean i was funny because i was literally just telling my girlfriend uh last night 
because she asked me how I met you. And I said, you know, I said, it was the last day of the G4 event. And, and you know, I'm sitting, you know, kind of in this room where all these guitars were, Bananas at Large. They had their, you know, their pop-up store. And you're sitting there and we're kind of looking at each other going, do I know you? And it's like, no, do I know you? <laughs> well, we should know each other, you know? And it, it, yeah. it, it was really cool. I, w- I wish we would have met on the first day because that would have been a blast. Yeah. Well, we know, I mean, we have a, a ton of, of the same friends and you yeah. only find that out through, you know, the social media and stuff. But we have we have a lot of the same friends, and that I think that goes a long way. We actually did a tour together too, which was uh, a lot of fun and and some stress and some pressure yeah. and some dust ups. But it, it's just it's one of those things where, um, you know, each each new thing that you do gives you more experience, and you, you're better for the next thing that you do after that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when we did that tour together, the Guitar Uproar Tour, you know, that was great. It was three shows, but it was fantastic. You know, I mean, I had a blast on it. It was a lot of fun to see you play and to see your band play. And Same. and it was just, you know, it, it was a to share the van together, you know, driving from, what did we drive from Vegas to Colorado? You know, yeah. that, that was, you know, that, that was, that was fun, man. I mean, you know, we had a big, <laughs> big van and, you know, piled everybody yeah. in it. And it, it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. You know, I would do that a lot differently now. I, I, the, the, the first thing I would do was have fun. Yeah. I don't think I had enough fun on that thing. I was too serious. I was too in my head. And I, I, you know, the other thing that happens is I had musicians from around the United States in my band. And now I think, you know, in a lot of ways that was a big mistake because, um, you know, you get who you can get sometimes whoever's available, but you need to gel with a person in a, in a rehearsal space for months and months. And, you know, for me, I grew up jamming with my buddies. Some of them were great. Some of them weren't so great, but you got to be good together because you spent so much time in that rehearsal space. And I think that was the one thing where it was like, you know, it was an all instrumental show. Every band played instrumental. So I think most of the other bands had months, if not years to prepare. And I had a day, (laughs) you know what I mean? So it kind of, I felt limited. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, it's like, because we, we talked about that, the, the band amongst ourselves, like, man, you know, Grace coming out here with, a, with you know, with these guys and, you know, they're, they're all top notch, right? You know, but they, they haven't rehearsed, right? I mean, you know, and, and yeah. what, you couldn't tell whatsoever. You could, you guys just were tight as hell, but it was like, you know, you could see that little bit of like, you know, the, you know, because when you rehearse every day or you rehearse, you know, twice a week and, you know, like you said, you're in a rehearsal room together all the time. And, and I think a lot of times you know, bands don't, they don't get that opportunity to do that, you know, and you have to, um, you have to gel with the person, right? You're married to them, you know, you're going to be married to that band and, and uh, you're going to have to know all their quirks and, you know, their personality traits and, and all that stuff. And, you know, you could learn it on the road, but is that the right place to learn it? Right. The guys you were with though, you've known those guys. (laughs) Yeah. You've known those guys though, right? The guys you played with. Well, right. Yeah, Rob, Rob Welch was on bass, and I've known him maybe for you know six or seven years. But the drummer, not so much. We had played some shows. I had just met him maybe, you know, for a few gigs prior. I played in Dallas, and he was doing this uh, event that we were playing that's for right. Sully Guitars. And I asked him if he wanted to do some shows, and that's what that was. And that that was my main thing. Is I had wished Joey and I would have gelled a little more. Um, Joey's younger than me, so the energy's considerably different. Joey has a shit ton of energy. And I don't all the time. And I'm also, an, you know, I'm very introverted when I'm not being public, yeah. you know, and I, I like my personal space. And honestly, I think, you know, being in the van for that many hours and being in direct sunlight, you know, because, you know, the way we were driving, I was on the sun side. Yeah. I couldn't escape it. I couldn't escape anything. Yeah. And when you're trying to just kind of get inside your own, you know, thoughts and kind of, you know, get ready for the next show mentally... Um, I think that was my biggest problem on that tour. But like I'm saying, if I did it again, I would I would spend the extra you know whatever 500 bucks and and get a get a vehicle and and also drive because that's yeah. the way to do it. You got to have comfortable you know travel arrangement. It just has to be. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, you know, you you see bands and you know and and, and everybody's piled into one one vehicle, right? And and there is something to be said for that because there's camaraderie there that, you know, if you guys could make it through this together, you can make it through anything. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because you hear about stories, you know, like the Scorpions, right? You know, later on and you know, on their tours, everybody in the band got 
separate limos. Everybody <laughs> got separate tour buses. You know, it's just yeah. like there was the, the only camaraderie was on that stage. You know, and yeah. it's just like uh, I I would never want to get to that point. You know, personally. Yeah. Well, we're different. Uh, I'm going to be 50 in another year. I don't know how old you are, man, but I, I, I would I, imagine you're. Well, I would say I'm old enough to. You don't have to divulge if you don't want to. I would say I'm old enough to know better and young enough not to care. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting to the point in my life where um, if I'm going to travel, it's going to be purposeful. I'm never going to. I'm never going to be the guy that's going to. Unless it's a big production tour, I don't want to be anywhere for more than four weeks at a time. Yeah. And I've done tours where it's like two weeks at a time, and that's enough. And it's been the type of thing where. Everybody that's been in the band has been super chill. But what we did was we did, uh, you know, different tours I've done. I've done the California coast a bunch, you know, and that's where you start in San Diego mm. and you basically co-op all the shows. So the crowds that are in San Diego, those bands, you know, they're, they're, you know, they follow the San Diego band. So you get the crowd, you know, by way of that. So then when you get to your hometown, the closer you get, your crowd then becomes their crowd, you know, and and so you're sharing, you know, you're staying at their house or you're, you know, that kind of thing. Because for for the level of musician I am, it's still very grassroots and it's still very much like, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the tour manager, I'm the one that pays everybody, I'm the one that books all the hotels, which I don't mind, you know. But um, yeah. So those that's how I've done it. I do a ton of fly-ins or I'll play with other people and stuff. But I can't imagine being on the road for more than a month. I'll do two. I'll do two weeks and then come home. Uh, but with COVID, we're kind of all you know sitting around. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to what's going to happen when I do go back out. And I think that's what's that. That's the way forward is uh, you know still fly-ins and you know try to do those co-op tours because they're fun. You know, they're fun. You get to someone's hosting you at their house. You know, and when people come to my house, I really want to make it great for them. You know, I want to make it super comfortable. You know, whatever they need, they can have it. You know. Yeah, for me, I, I love being on the road personally. I mean, you know, if I, you know, give me two months on the road, three months, I, I'll do it. You know, it's, uh, it, for me, it's the, it's not only the excitement of a different city every night and you barely get to see the city, but it's, it's that, that journey, right? The driving and seeing all the towns and stopping in the, you know, the, the, the truck stops and, and, uh, you know, just seeing what each little town or each big city has to offer. Um, and that, that to me is as exciting as that, you know, 30 minutes to an hour on stage that you get to play and, and, uh, you know, and then you meet people afterwards and all that stuff. And, and, uh, you really do, you know, make friends on the road, you know, it's, it's lifelong friends. I've, I've, you know, I've met people on the road that I'm still really close with now that I may not see, you know, um, until next time I go on tour, but we keep in contact. Um, and to me, that's, that's exciting, you know? You know what I noticed is when I started really touring it was probably in the I don't know I want to say to, after 2012 was when I really decided that I was going to be serious about it. And when you start playing in front of people, those are the true fans. I noticed. I feel like that's really when you meet someone, shake someone someone's hand at a clinic or whatever it is, because I've done a bunch of clinics too before then, and those people still connect. They still, you know, I don't want to sound egotistical, but they still follow and they still, you know, engage. And I think that's so important, you know, and I mean, this is no new information that you got to be in front of people. You got to play your show. They got to connect with it in some way. Yeah. That's so important to be, to be able to connect with people is so important. Absolutely. And you know, there, there is, you know, you, you see the, you know, the big, huge bands, right? The untouchable bands, the ones that, you know, you're not just going to walk up to and say, hey, man, how you doing? I love the show, you know, but there's that mid-level artist that that people can still get access to. And there's something to be said for, you know, the unattainable rock star, because I think I think yeah. that's still a romanticized um, idea, right? That you know, you're, you're, tear, yeah. you're tearing through town and, you know, you're playing and you're, you know, just it, people are getting excited and then you're off to the next town, you know? And, and it's like that old West kind of, you know, pillaging or, or the Vikings, right? They come through town, they <laughs> pillage, you know, and then they're, they're out. They take the spoils and then they leave. And, uh, yeah. you know, but the mid-level artists, you can still get access to them and you can still go up to them after a show or catch them by the bus. And, and, and to me, that's, that's where true um, kind of uh, friendships are forged 
is is after the show, you know, and they come up to the merch booth and they're like, man, I really love the show. And and you, you know, exchange numbers with them or, you know, you exchange email addresses with them. And I've got some photos I took of you. I'd love to send them to you. And, you know, yeah. and the rapport starts, right? And you realize that they're just as big of a music fan as you are. And, Absolutely. you know, they're not some crazy groupie or some crazy stalker right they're, 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 they just There's love the music too, oh absolutely <laughs> they're definitely out i've got there. a couple that i i've got a couple on my uh socials that i just keep there because i know if i don't it's gonna go it's gonna get bad uh, yeah oh <laughs> they're, absolutely they're gonna they're gonna escalate that stalkerism right? so i just leave it that's right i engage as much as i possibly can yeah <laughs> yeah you engage at arm's length right um, yeah yeah nah it's it's all good look I don't have anything to hide if, if sure. I meet anyone. I'm just, I'm the same guy as I am if I'm on stage. Yeah, you know? absolutely, man. I mean, and that's the beauty of it, right? That's the beauty of, of playing music, you know? Yeah. How can we, how can we get more like uh, topical? How can we get more into July 2nd, 2021? I mean, do you have, do you have a, you know, I, th I think really what I want to do with the show is talk, you know, we'll talk like music news. Um, Cause I have my opinions about, a ton of stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to talk gear on this show. Um, you know, I'm, I'm writing my new record called Reflexive, which, you know, those that follow me know about, and I'll, I'll be releasing that in August. You have a new band yeah. as well. You want to talk about that? And then we'll, maybe we'll get into some news. Absolutely. You know, we didn't really plan anything. No, but, no. And that, but I love yeah. that, right? I love that we yeah. didn't, we're just like, hey, let's just talk. Let's have a conversation, right? Between two right. friends. And that makes it more engaging, right? When you see podcasts and they're kind of like, Oh yeah, this is scripted. We're going to talk about this and this and this. And you're like, I don't know, man. I'm not really into that. You know, I don't really want to listen well, to that. I want to respond to that, but I, I want to talk about your new band. Yeah. But I want to say that if you'll notice, I'm doing everything that I'm doing for art's sake. I definitely try to keep feeding the machine so I can keep going playing live. That's really what I would like to do. I like to be on stage and I like to interact with other musicians. That's why I'm doing this. Um, but I'm doing it for art. And I've never asked anyone to, you know, you know, I've never asked anyone to do anything, you know, as far as, you know, paying for stuff. The music is always free. I mean, shirts, I have to pay for them. So, you know, people pay for those, but I have giveaways and stuff. I would like to take a second though, since I'm not sponsored, you know, I would like to say uh, thanks to Victory Amps, uh, Punch Pedals, who made, design my uh, signature pedal. I don't know if oh, you know. Oh yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty badass. Um, the string source strings, Fishman pickups, and these are just folks that if I need something, I don't have to. I don't have to ask twice. Yeah. They just send it to me, and they've always been super supportive. Um, I don't get paid by any of them, but I do get the gear, and that's really important to me. I, I try not to ask for too much. Fishman Ken Susie has been so rad in sending me stuff. You know, it's it, it's just like, you know you. I kind of feel guilty in a way when I get yeah. stuff because I want to promote the hell out of whatever I'm given, you know, and that's really, I think that's the the marketing return that, that they get as well. Um, so, but I do want to say one thing, you know, again, we're going to please remind me, I want to talk about your band. Oh, no worries. I want to hear about that. Um, I am moving away from social media in the traditional sense in that Facebook and, and Instagram, Facebook more so, um, I don't know what the hell they're thinking. But they're they're choking, uh, you know, the artistic side of things as far as music and, and entertainment and stuff. I don't even want to go into the details of why they're doing it. I don't even want to research it. I don't give a shit. What I'll say is they can go F themselves. Um, you can find me at, at uh, Greg Mara Music or Mara Music on YouTube. So that's where I'm going to be giving regular updates each day, each second day, whatever it is, it'll be a regular update. So anyone that wants to find me, go to Greg Mara Music on YouTube. You can also go to gregmara.com. Um, that has my entire musical catalog for free in the best quality version. You can download it. Um, you know, please buy a pedal. I would love that. I definitely, I get money if you buy a pedal <laughs> from me. It's called The Uppercut by Punch Pedals. Uh, Rob Ardent designed it. Um, I will also say that if you buy a shirt from me or some sort of merch package, um, I get money from that. Uh, I'd like to set up a Patreon page because that will certainly help me continue to produce things. Um, so anyway, that's enough about me. Bill, let's hear about your new band. Well, I mean, to, to, to go back to your to your thing about the the, the pedals and all that stuff and the, and the companies, you know, those are the companies that you stick with because they're loyal to you, right? 
I mean, it, it's the the big major companies. You know, they, they, they all they, want, they most of them they want the artist to do all the promotion and they they throw the artist crumbs, right? But but the artist, you know, like your pedal company and and uh, Fishman and all that. They understand, you know, and they're, they're, they're there to help the real artist. And those are the ones you stick with, you know, those are the ones you give your loyalty to. Um, Absolutely. You know, so, so the band, I mean, so, so this band started uh, 2000, well, about, I guess, June, 2019. And uh, what happened was, is I was on the road with my band, Lanero, and we were out on tour with Tony McAlpine, and the tour was going great um, until we're woken up at five thirty. Me, Tony, and the tour manager woken up at five thirty in the morning by the tour by the tour bus driver telling us that we owe him eighteen thousand dollars. Yeah, needless to say. We well, were, so so wait, let me just back up. I just want to. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I, right. it, we even started this by saying, "Hey, I hate that one," <laughs> <laughs> but I want to really get the true story. So you're yes. on tour with Tony McAlpine. Yep. Your That's band all, is on tour. Our third U.S. tour with Tony. Yeah. And I remember when this all went down. So yeah, just so let me let circle me circle back again because I want to hear. I really want to hear about it. All right, so I'm going to lay out the facts of this tour from, <laughs> from, because there's some stuff on the internet against me from past band members, right? And I would love to clear the air with oh, everybody out there, right? So, yeah. so let, me, let me lay this out here. So we're on this tour with Tony McAlpine and the tour's going great. And me and Tony and his band, we go on this cruise to Cozumel and we do all this, right? And it was fantastic. And we get back and the tour bus driver says, well, you know, you guys owe us $18,000. We're like, what the hell do we owe, owe you $18,000 for? It's like, first off, I already put in my share for the tour bus, I don't know you anything, right? This is all, you know, so the, Tony had this tour manager I'm not going to name. And um, we're woken up at, at, at uh, 5.30 in the morning. We're in uh, Joliet, Illinois, and it's about 16 degrees below zero with a wind chill factor, right? Snow everywhere. Basically, in a love truck stop, told that we got to get off the bus if we don't pay him $18,000. So all of our gear, all the bands, all three bands, we had us, Tony's band and Monty Pittman from Madonna hit the guitar player. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah, so he was on the tour with us. So all of our gears, we have to take all of our gear off the bus, off the, at the trailer of the bus. And we're out there and find out later that basically the tour manager uh, screwed everybody, that he didn't pay what he should have been paying. And so it all came down on everybody else. Um, so, so we're out there and... And me and Tony are standing there like, oh, man, what are we going to do, right? Like, you know, do we continue on with the tour? Do we go to, you know, the next shows were like Canada. Do we go to Canada? Like, what do we do here? So he kind of made the decision like, you know what? Let's just call it. We're just, we'll, we'll pick it up at a later date, you know, but let's, let's just salvage what we can, you know. So him and I decided, okay, look, let's rent a U-Haul trailer. Or actually, it was a Ryder trailer. And me and him, me and Tony, we're going to drive across country together in this, you know, rental, you know, truck, box truck and drive all the gear back home. Well, before, when we, did, when we got the truck, my band comes to me and says, hey, you got the gear, right? You, you can take care of the gear. We're going to fly back home. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of it. So they get in an Uber, nice, cozy, warm Uber, right? And they drive to Chicago in the Uber and they catch a flight back home two days later, you know, boom, they're, they're back home. So I said to Tony after they left, I said, that's the last time I will ever speak to them. It's the last time I'll ever be in a band with them because they basically left me. Now I could have been a dick. I could have took all their gear. I could have just left it there, you know, and said, you know what? You figure out a way to get it home. But I didn't do that. You know, I can sleep at night. I have no problem sleeping at night, right? So we drove back all the way back. It took us, I believe, 10 days to drive from Joliet, Illinois to uh, California, right? So unloaded all of Tony's gear. Um, we did a stop in Nashville to, to unload some of his band's gear. Um, and then we just continued on our way and we drove and we had the absolutely best time, man, driving back home. It was fantastic. It was just a lot of fun. So I basically got back and uh, to California, and I and I get a phone call from the guitar player in the band, um, who I will not name names, yelling at me, telling, 
oh, you, you owe me and Mike and, and, and Will, you owe us money. And I was like, I owe you money for what? Well, is, is it true you were going to do an album? Um, but there's this other guy that the, the, this guy that, um, I was friends with that, uh, basically paid me to write an album, an instrumental album for him. And, uh, it was a good substantial amount of money. And I said, yeah, I said, that that's true. Absolutely true. Well, we want our share of that. I said, what makes you think you are owed anything of that? I said, the contract literally, and this, this guy was a lawyer that, that, uh, that wrote the, that financed this project. Um, he says, uh, I said, well, what makes you think that you're owed any of that money? Well, we're in your band. I said, yeah, but this album that I'm doing has nothing to do with Lonero. It's a solo project that I'm going to hire other musicians to play on. In fact, he didn't even want Lonero to play on it. He said, I would like to have other musicians play on it. I said, okay. So the contract literally states it's between me, Bill Lonero, and this other guy. So I said, you know, where in this contract does it say your name? Nowhere. I said, it says Bill Lonero. Doesn't even state Lonero. Just says Lonero, uh, Bill Lonero. Hey, well, we're going to sue you. I said, well, go ahead. You could try it. You know, you're not going to get a damn penny because you're. This, this has nothing to do with you guys. So I basically said to him, I said, look, you guys got 24 hours to get your gear out of the studio. I'm changing the locks. End of story. Band's over. That's it. That's the end of it. That's the end of Lonero. Just like that. You know? So it, luckily, I, a friend of mine, uh, Jason, was at the show and uh, with his stepson, and they filmed uh, pretty much the whole show and all the photos of the very last Lanera show, and I was very happy for that. Um, but then what happened was, is I pretty much was like, I'm done with music for a few months. You know, I, I thought I was done with music, period, because it left such a bad taste in my mouth, right? And so one day, out of the blue, I get a I get a a, a message on Instagram from this guy. And he says, uh, hey, man, I, I, I see, you know, you're, you're done with the band, Lanero, and I, I really think you and I should start a band together. I, you know, I've been watching you, and, you know, we did one show together, and, and you know, I've been watching you, I, I, I've been keeping up, and I, I, think we, I think we'd be a good fit, man. And I, did, I actually didn't read that message. I just saw the message from him, and I let it sit for like two months because I thought it was from somebody else. I thought, I thought this was completely from somebody else, right? And I was like, well, I don't want to read the, the message from this person, right? So I finally read it. I was like, oh, this is Andrew, right? This is a singer guy. So I sent him a message and he called me on the phone and we just hit it off right off the bat. And so the next day he came to my studio and we chatted for like three hours in my studio. And he says, well, I got a bass player, man. I got this, you know, this guy, Stevie, he's, you know, he's, he's great. He's rock and roll, man. I said, all right, well, you know, bring him down. And I think it was either the next day or maybe uh, the following week he came down to the studio and we just jammed. And it was great, man. And we just, we just sat there and we jammed and, and we didn't have a drummer and I knew this guy and, and we ended up, uh, this guy, Rick, and we ended up jamming and it worked out perfectly. Um, so, it, you know. It, What's the name of the band? Royal Rebels. Royal Rebels is such a cool name. What is that? What does that derive from? We know it, it, we had a list of name ma- names, about a hundred yeah. <laughs> names, and we were just going through this list, and it was so many different different names, man. October Falling was one of them, and we're like, what, what does that even mean, <laughs> right? But you know, we all decided yeah. on Royal Rebels, and uh, and, and it, shadows fall. Yeah, right, right, right? exactly. <laughs> and so uh, you know, it, we recorded some songs. We, you know, we written a bunch of songs, and. Uh, it just, it all kind of fell in place. The vibe was there, and that was very important, right? And you got to have the vibe, and uh, we all get along. And then, you know, as we were writing these new songs, um, I said, well, you know what? We need another guitar player. Let's get another guitar player in here, a rhythm guitar player. And I ended up, you know, I called up my old guitar player, William uh, Baglivio from uh, from Lanero. Uh, he recorded on the Relentless album, and and uh, he actually filled in on the first six dates of the last tour with Tony. So he was just, you know, perfect, perfect personality, everything. So he joined and, uh, and here we are, you know, so. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Where can folks find you online? Uh, RoyalRebelsBand.com and pretty much anywhere just Royal Rebels Band is, is the, the, you know, social media links. I knew you'd have the, the .com. 
Yeah. You had people's dot coms that were famous Dude, I, that didn't even have their dot com. Right. Tell that story. Yeah. Wait well, a minute. You're telling long stories. You got to shorten up your stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, man. No, no. Tell, you, tell your story the way it's. Uh, All but, right. dude, so you had, so you got Royal Rebels Band dot com. Yep. And you also had Joe Satriani dot, dot net dot, dot, dot com dot org dot, dot com. Which one was dot it? Dot com and dot net. So damn, yeah. Tell so, that story. Real so quick. that that's actually a, a cool story <laughs> that led to a really good friendship. Um, so I was in bed one night, and it's three o'clock in the morning. And I just literally woke up, like eyes wide open. What year is this? Two thousand four. Two thousand crazy. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. So I wake up. And I don't know, I went down, I lived in a two-story condo and I, I went down to my studio down in the, the first floor. And I don't know why, but I, I sat at the, on the, at the mixing console. I thought, I wonder what Joe Satriani is doing right now. And I don't know why that popped into my head, right? So I go on the internet, the old intraweb, and I typed joesatriani.com. And it's all, you know, basically no page. I'm like, what? I'm like, well, maybe it's .net. So I typed .net up and no page. I'm like, what the hell? So I go to GoDaddy. And I type joesatriana.com and it's all, this domain is available, $3.99. And I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? So I, I, I run, dude, I run upstairs, I get my credit card, I run back downstairs and log in and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna buy this. Let's see if this actually happens. And I click purchase and it's all, congratulations, joesatriana.com is in your account. And I'm like, what the fuck? So, right, so, so I, let's try joesatriani.net and boom, it's available. I'm like, this is crazy, right? So I can't sleep now. I'm like <laughs> wide awake, right? So the next morning, I call my friend, Niels Lozauer, photographer guy who you know, right? And yeah. so I call him up and I said, hey, Neil, I just bought joesatriani.com and .net. And his first reply was, why? And I go, well, first, because it was available. And he goes, well, what do you want to do with it? You want to sell it back to him? And I, he goes, I go, well, no, I want to give it to him. He goes, you want to give yeah. them to him? I said, well, of course. I said, they're his domains. He should own them, right? He goes, well, what do you want me, yeah. you want me to call him? And I said, yeah, dude, that would be great. So he goes, okay. So I'm in, in my studio, you know, and I'm just kind of, you know, dicking around and, and the phone rings and I'm like, four, one, you know, five phone number. I'm like, what the hell? So I answer the phone. And, he goes, and you're, you're up there too. I'm, you're in San Francisco Bay Area as well. Yeah. yeah, I was in San Jose at the time. Now I'm in San Francisco. So I said, yeah. I answer the phone. He goes, is Bill there? And I go, this is Bill. And he goes, Oh, this is Joe Saturani. And I went, holy shit, right? This is like really uh -huh. happening, right? And I go, hey, Joe, how are you doing? He goes, good, good, good. How are you? And I, I'm good. And he goes, I just got a phone call from Neil. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then we didn't talk about the domain until the end of the conversation. And he goes, well, you know, I, 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 my accountant's not in town right now. He goes, but I, I can get you a check when he gets back. How much were you thinking for the domains? I said, well, did Neil tell you? I go, I don't want any money for the domains. They're yours. You should have them. I just want to transfer them to you. And he was silent on the phone for a good amount of time. And he goes, for free? And I go, yeah. He goes, wow. He goes, oh, thank you. He goes, well, let, let me get my web guy to get a hold of you and, and he'll, he can handle all the transferring. I really appreciate that. And he, he says, well, you know, and then I, got, I get a message from him a, a few months later. He says, well, I'm playing the film more. Do you want to come to the show? And I said, well, that'd be great. And we had a mutual friend, Frank Casanova. And so Frank said, you know, me and Frank went to the show and it was fantastic. I mean, it was great. And Joe and I just stood in the hallway of the Fillmore and just kind of hanging out, talking. And he was just the most gen genuous, um, generous um, person you'd ever want to meet. Very humble, very, you know, uh, soft-spoken. And, and after that, we kind of didn't really keep in contact um, very much, you know, uh, I, you know, message him on his birthday, send him an email, whatever. Then I get a call from Neil uh, again. And he says, hey, I'm going to chicken Sammy's studio to go shoot chicken foot for four days. Do you want to come and help? You know, because it's up this way. Said, well, yeah, absolutely. I would love that, right? So I, I go with them. And we, you know, we meet up at my house and, and drive with them out there. And and, and it's spending four days with Joe. And, and kind of that that connection was rekindled. And, and now it's, 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 you know, much closer than, than ever. So just You've done a, some products with him too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. strap tight strap locks. Uh, you know, and, and that, and because of that meeting originally with Joe, I was able to text Joe, and I said to him, I said, "Hey, Joe, I I know you don't have a, I know I know you don't use strap locks, and I think I know why." 
But I've got an idea that I'm working on and I would love to, to, to bring them by and, and, and show them to you and get your opinion on them. So he said, okay. He said, bring them by tomorrow. He says, and, and, uh, and let's see what you got. I said, okay. So I get to his house, me and Frank again, we, we go to his house because Frank was closer to him at this point than I was. Right. Um, so I, I go to, go to Joe's house and, uh, and he has three guitars laid out on his, his table. And he says, uh, if you can get a strap lock on these, I'm sold. I was like, all right. So I take my, you know, little invention and I pop, it's a prototype, right? So I pop it on the first one, take it off, pop it on the second, take it off, pop it on the third one. And he stands there looking at it and he slaps his forehead and he goes, that is the dumbest, most brilliant idea I've ever seen. He goes, <laughs> he goes why didn't I come up with that? And he goes, this yeah. is so simple. He goes, do you need an endorsee? And I was like, are you kidding me? Absolutely. Yeah. And he's been a champion of strap tight ever since. I mean, he, one, killing, yeah, man. one day I get a message from him. He goes, Hey, Glenn Hughes is going to be contacting you. He goes, we just worked in the studio together. I showed him the strap locks and, and he loves them. And so like next day I get an email from Glenn Hughes and, and Joe is just a great guy. Not only, you know, obviously his musicianship is, is, you know, stands alone. Don't even need to talk about that, but his personality is so just warm. This podcast sponsored by Strap Tight Strap Locks, the most secure, affordable guitar strap locks on the market. Install and remove in under two seconds. No need for any tools. Endorsed by legends such as Joe Satriani, Glenn Hughes, Carl Verheyen, and more. Get yours at straptight.com. Well, I'd like to tie in our, uh, our connection. So yourself, myself, as you mentioned before, we're sitting backstage at the uh, G4 event. Do you remember what they call that? Uh, I wasn't it just G four? It might have been just G four experience. Like I think it was the G four experience. Like yeah. So we're sitting in this room, and it was breakdown day. So we, I think I had, so I had, because I was working for Bananas at Large. Uh, you know, we had all of Phil Collins' signature guitars there. We had Joe Satriani guitars, Paul Gilbert guitars. There were Warren D Martini guitars, which yes, you they have. Gifted me yeah, one of them. I know. I have one of I them. Know. Yeah, and he signed it. So uh, That's pretty great. cool. So we're, it's just you and I sitting there and um, uh, there's nobody there. Yeah. This is the, the last day of the event. And in fact, I think I only had four more Jackson Phil Collin PC1s that we hadn't sold. And uh, it's midday. It's maybe after lunch, something like that. And we're everybody's done. We're, we're all cooked. We're fried. We want to go home. And you and I are sitting there on the fold-out chairs. <laughs> yep. So behind me are the Phil Collin, the four guitars we had left, and a poster of Phil Collin with his shirt off, all glossed up with his abs just, <laughs> you know, man, it just looks incredible. I mean, it makes a straight dude right? think twice, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, is that PC? Can I talk? Ah, ah who sure. Who gives a shit? If they get this deep, if they get 30 minutes into the podcast and they're going to be offended, go fuck yourself. Right, there you go. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, Joy Satriani walks in, and now I had like just kind of like in passing conversations with him. And, you know, I got to talk with a lot of those guys. Warren Martini, like, again, like I'm saying, Phil Collin, we ran the Black Star back line and had his guitars and for signings and stuff. You know, we were the ones that were sponsoring Bananas at Large, uh, were sponsoring the guitar, so we had to be involved. And, you know, I had gotten to talk to Joe, but it was in a context where it wasn't just me and him and you. You know what I mean? It was like very much like there were other people involved. And I know he had some funny things to say, which I don't remember, you know, specifically what he said, but he made some comments about, oh, Joe, why don't you take your shirt off for this, for this event? Why don't you go shirtless? Like Phil, he looks great, you know, in his fifties. And I know, I don't remember what he said, but he had something funny and warm to say, but it was funny, you know, and Joe always gives you that impression that there's no venom behind anything that he says. And he even had some things to say about some of the products that he had been endorsing and was no longer endorsing when people would ask him at the meet and greets. And he was just the most uh, warm and like I'm saying, uh, somewhat passive. Uh, there was no venom. It was just, he's just a nice warm spirit. And really what that does is that inspires you to be, you know, it really is that karma thing playing out in real time where you're going, if you're an asshole to someone they're likely going to be an asshole to the next guy they have to talk to. If you're cool, same thing. And Joe just always seems to me in interviews that he's funny, light, warm, just a nice guy. And I, I learned a lot, you know, even in, you know, in my mid, I think it was 45 or something when we did that show or whatever. But 
you just learn from the best of like how to be professional and classy and uh, stay positive. Well, yeah, not only that, when you're talking to him, to Joe, he makes you feel like you are the only person in that room. Only person in the room. You know, That's right. and and it's that, that and that I think is, uh, it's the eye contact, right? A lot of people, when they're talking, they don't they don't have that eye contact, right? They're looking around the room and they're, they're doing all this. They're looking up at the sky, but you know, it's like that eye contact makes all the difference in the world. And you know, I got on that uh, that that G four to to shoot it because I found out that Joe was doing G four, and and so I just sent a message, Joe, just you know, I, I see you're doing G four, you know, that's great. I, I'd love to come to it, you know, if possible. And I said, and he goes, well, yeah, he goes, absolutely. He goes, why don't you come on out? And I said, I said, I'll tell you, I said, I don't want to come out though and just hang out. I said, I would love to come out and help out yeah. whatever I Same. can. Yeah. And he, and he goes, well, wh what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I said, I can shoot photos. He goes, that would be great. All right. So he had his manager contact me and he's like, you, you want to shoot photos for it? And I said, absolutely. So I ended up shooting photos for that. And shot the Tom, Tommy Emanuel group shots and the Satriani group shots and, and all that and shooting video. And, and uh, then the, the, the organizer of the event says, hey, do you want to come out to New York and shoot the John Petrucci uh, event universe? And I was like, yeah. So, you know, they ended, up, they ended up flying me out there, you know, putting me up in the Glen Cove mansion where the event was being held. And, and you know, w w what's crazy is, is, you know, when I got there, Tony was playing. I didn't realize Tony was going to be there. Um, Tony McAlpine yeah, listeners. Yeah, and and yeah, when your personal buds traveling across the United States <laughs> with a with a, a a living legend, you just call him Tony. But just, the, the rest of us mortals call him Tony McAlpine. I call him other things too, you know. And he calls me other things. You know, we have a nice little banter back and forth. But he he thought I was mad at him. So because he after the so this goes back a little ways right 2015 we fired our third we had a, a, another guitar player in the band we had three guitar players in the band and, uh, and uh you know just to, to fatten up the sound well on the end of the uh i believe it was the geez was it the first tour or the second tour I, I it was the i believe it was the end of the second tour we fired him so i find out that tony hires that guy as rhythm guitar player. And I'm like, oh, that's a big mistake, right? This is going to be nothing but drama. So I posted on Facebook something completely irrelevant. I said, it really sucks when your heroes let you down. And, and that got to back to him. And I was like, well, that really wasn't even about Tony, right? The timing was really bad, but you know, for it is what it is, right? So I'm walking through the halls of this Glen Cove mansion and I hear Billy from behind me. And I turn around and it's Tony. And I was like, oh, sh like, what the hell? What are you doing here, right? He goes, hey, he goes, I think we should have a talk. And I said, all right, you know, let, let's have a talk. So we go into his room and, and he says, uh, so tell me, tell me about, you know, I heard you're mad at me. I said, well, I'm not mad at you, Tony. I said, oh, I'm a little disappointed. I said, yeah, sure. He goes, well, tell me why. And I, and I explained to him and, and he goes, is it really that bad? Is he really that bad of a, of a person? I said, Tony, I said, what I've just told you doesn't even scratch the surface. And I said, but you know what? You got, you got to do what you got to do to make this tour work. And that's fine, right? Well, we, we, we were great throughout that, throughout that whole thing. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Sure. What's the timeline? So, is this, so your band dissolves. Is this before yes. or after? You got to put it in context because I'm a okay. little confused as to. So your band, you dissolved, and then that guy went and joined Tony's band? No, let me back up. So 2015 yeah, yeah. was when this whole event happened. Ah, this all happened many... Okay, got it. That was when the, 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 yeah, the breakup with, with him. Um, the, the event with the John Petrucci Universe, I believe, was 2000... Well, when was the G4? 2017. Okay, so this would have been 2018 with, because it was the next year with the Petrucci thing. Uh, it may have been the same year, actually, 2017. So um, basically, you know, I told him everything was great. Tony and I, we spent the whole week together, every day, just hanging out and all that stuff. Um, and then I find out that Tony actually fires that guy right before he plays the hometown show here in San Francisco. And it was great. And then I saw Tony at NAMM and he, he comes up to me. I said, 
I, I, I was I was kind of excited. And I go, so how was it? He goes, bro, it was worse than you could have ever imagined. <laughs> so so I was like, all right. So I wasn't crazy, you know, and, and you know, and, and it all worked out, you know. So Tony and I- Do I know this guy? You don't have to name names. Maybe, I maybe don't not. think you do. When we did our tour together, the Guitar Uproar Tour, he wasn't in the band. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're going to talk about uh, Prairie Sun Recording Studio in Northern California. I, uh, I'm, you know, look, I'll just, uh, I'll just say, I've been given the right to make a documentary on Prairie Sun, and I'm extremely happy. Uh, you know, I couldn't be more interested in investing my time in this project. We'll have some celebrity uh, folks in it, folks that have recorded there. Um, and uh, so my story goes back to when I'm really first starting to get into instrumental guitar music. And I bought Racer X Second Heat on cassette. And on the back, it says, uh, you know, Shrapnel Records, Mike Varney, producer, recorded at Prairie Sun. And so all of these things seemed super magical when I was 17 years old and a senior in high school. And as I'm listening to these, these songs, I'm like, man, this is incredible. And then I'm just buying more from the Shrapnel catalog, and they all say Prairie Sun. And then you're looking at the artists on it, Atma Anur, Bruce Bouillet, Paul Gilbert. I'm just kind of completely name drop of all the people that I've played with, too. <laughs> that does sound like a complete uh, you know pat on my own back, but I sought that out. My goal was to be able to play with some of these people or be in the same circle. And look, it's clearly 30 years past its expiration date. This stuff happened in the late 80s, early 90s. But I've gotten to play with a lot of people that have been on the Shrapnel Records uh, label. And even, in fact, Mike Varney in 2005 interview, interviewed me for the Spotlight column, pulling me right into that circle, man. Just he just he I tell you what, he gave me such a nice lift and boost to be able to have credibility in the industry. And I can't thank Mike Varney enough for, for putting me in his spotlight column. May 2005, if you don't believe me, Guitar Player Magazine. <laughs> I've, got, I've got that issue. I'm going to go look. It's, <laughs> I'm it's read funny it. because, yeah, I keep posting it every couple of years because I'm just so proud of it. But you should be. It probably does seem like a complete humble brag, you know, like, oh, yeah. this jackass is posting this again. But, but you really, know what? honestly, it means it means so much to me. It means it means so much to me to be included in the in that name group. I've gotten to play with Paul Gilbert. I was in Bruce Bouillet's band from Racer X. Ray Luzier's done music on my records. Atma Anur, I did a tour with him. So I couldn't be happier. I mean, I'm super proud of that part of my life. Well, you know, here's the thing. You know, people when you when you when you say a name, right, of somebody you've played with, right? I don't. I hear people, oh, name dropping it. It's not name dropping. It's your experience. What, what are you yeah. supposed to do? Say, oh, well, I'm going to replace Atma Noor's name with, uh, I don't know, Ronald McDonald, so people don't get offended. It's like, <laughs> no, you played with Atma Noor. You played with Bruce Boulay. You should be proud of this. You pray, played with Super Ray proud. Lugier. So I, I, know, I don't feel guilty whatsoever if I say, yeah. oh, yeah, I've toured with Tony McAlpine, or I played with Cliff Williams. Or, that's... I'm proud of that. That's your credit. That's right. Yeah. I work towards that. You work towards that. Everybody who has, why would you work towards something just to dismiss it or downplay it? Right? It's for the assholes out there that well, you know are going to shoot you out of the sky. Well, and I can name them. names of the folks that I know are going to say stuff. But well, fuck I, them. I guess let's yeah, f you definitely know? fuck them. Right? Let's segue into our involvement in Prairie Sun. So I've been given the rights to make this documentary, which. I've already, you know, you you were kind enough. So I want to rewind to 2018. I don't remember which month, might have been May, something like that. You said, I said, hey man, I would love to go to Prairie Sun. And I know you had done some work there. And you're like, well, guess what? You're gonna go and I'm gonna take you. And you introduced me to Muka and and some of the other staff there. And we toured the entire facility every well, I feel like most of it. Yeah, we did. And everywhere. Uh, and I was very honored to have even been on those hallowed grounds where all of those records that really made who I was as a guitar player and countless others. I mean, you talk to anybody that is from our generation, even today. I mean, Jason Becker, oh, Marty Friedman, yep. Paul Gilbert, Bruce Bouillet. I mean, Tony McAlpine, the list goes on. And, Vinnie Moore, it goes on and goes on, on and on. Ingve. And the thing is, is you and I had a conversation maybe not two weeks ago where we talked about, it was the first time talking after a while. Mm -hmm. And we talked about an hour 
and had more to say about yeah. just Prairie Sun. So I'm going to do this documentary. I know you've worked there. You introduced me, took me on the tour, and uh, got to meet a lot of those folks. And uh, so I'm going to be going up there in August. And I, and I know that you and I talked about getting some like aerial footage, drone footage. So you're also going to be in the documentary as well in one of the studios talking about your experience. But maybe you just want to kind of pad into that a little bit. Well, so I'm going to rewind a little bit too. Um, you know, I, I heard about, you know, Shrapnel and, and, you know, Prairie Sun and all that through obvious. I mean, sorry, I heard about Prairie Sun through all the Shrapnel albums, right? You know, I was a huge fan of Vinnie Moore and, you know, Paul Gilbert and Tony McAlpine and all these guys, right? So for me, it was like this place, like you said, is was paradise. It's like, okay, this is Mecca as a guitar player. And so I remember I lived up in the area. I lived in Santa Rosa, which was, you know, maybe 10 miles from Katati, which is where Prairie Sun is. And I thought, man, I, I've got to go here, right? So I remember driving. I found the address and I drove past it. And from the outside, it's a house and a gate. Yeah. And I was like- It's a, it's a farm. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> where, yeah, it's a farm. Where's, yeah. where's Prairie Sun? So I thought, how am I going to get on the grounds? Like, how am I going to get past that gate, right? So I remember yeah. going, I know how. I'm going to call them up and ask them, how much would it be to record there? And I'm going to, I'll see if I can go there and take a tour. And I did. And, <laughs> and it was way out of my price range. Ain't never going to happen, yeah. right? So fast forward, uh, it's working on the Defiant Machine album. And we went there to remix the album at Prairie Sun. And we spent five days there um, living on the property. They have a, a, a guest house, two bedroom guest house in the front, in the back. And then they have like an apartment uh, with a loft actually across from the studios, across the driveway. And just being there immersed in Prairie Sun. And, and it was amazing. So then fast forward to last year, we actually went to record basically uh, what turned out to be Royal Rebels demos uh, in the room where all the Shrapnel albums were recorded. Um, the hollowed stone wall room, you know, uh, with yeah. the Pete Townsend Neve board that Pete Townsend yeah, owned man. that he recorded part of Quadrophenia on. And then fast forward to, what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we were in the studio recording the new Royal Rebel albums, Royal Rebel albums with Simon Phillips on uh, producing it. Legendary Simon Phillips. Right. Simon Phillips, give a little bit of uh, a history on him. I mean, he's he's uh, done the Jeff Beck. He's, the, he, I mean, he was on a Jeff Beck record that just like blows my mind when I hear his drumming. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, tons of others, but he's a producer. Yeah, well, so so he was co-writer, wrote half the There and Back album by Jeff Beck. He was the Who drummer for years, Toto drummer for twenty years. Um, so my drummer Rick had kind of befriended Simon because uh, he went to one of Simon's master classes. And I guess they kept in contact and he came to the band, uh, Rick did say, hey, what would you guys think about Simon Phillips producing? And honestly, to be honest with you, I was like, mm, I don't know. You know, it's like, Ew. he's a big jazz fusion guy and, yeah. and, you know, we're a rock and roll band and I didn't know anything really. I mean, I knew about Simon Phillips. I knew his history, but I didn't know him personally. So I was like, well, I don't know how this is going to be, but, you know, I guess so. Then we met, I, I, I met him on a, Zoom, on a Zoom chat and he was the most pleasant, joyful, happy, funny guy you'd ever want to meet. And I, I felt all my reservations went out the window. So then we fast forward, we go into the studio with him and it was the most relaxed I've ever been in a recording studio in my entire life. He couldn't have been a, a, a better person to be in the studio with, you know? Yeah. It, it, it was, it was cool, fantastic. Man. Yeah. It, I, I, you know, I mean, I would spend, I tell everybody this, I would spend every single day in the studio with Simon for a year straight if I could, you know, <laughs> I mean, too. <seriously>. Then <laughs> we went, awesome. go, yeah, we went go karting. That says a lot. Absolutely, dude. And we went go karting on the fifth day. So we had four days in the studio with them. Fifth day, we went go karting. My drummer beat him, but he beat me and my, and my bass player, Stevie. So he's a professional race car driver. He used to drive professionally. Very cool. You know, wow. so Incredible. yeah, what a great guy. Well, I would love to have, uh, I would love to have Simon on the show. Like I was saying, oh, hold on a sec. Are you still there, Bill? Yep, I'm still here. Sorry. We're, like I said, we're on a, a slow connection. I've got a lot of devices working off one Wi-Fi. And, uh, but I'd love to have Simon on the show and likely that'll happen here in the future. We're going to have some some uh some very special guests and we're gonna have we're gonna turn this i think into a video version of the podcast because look i love to watch youtube and i think i really want to 
you know, have another means of uh, people seeing, you know, what they're hearing. And I think that's important too. And there's going to be a lot of stuff we can do to, to share, you know, experiences. I don't know if you're able to do this, but I've done this on some other shows when I was testing out a new format. And that was, I had a means of recording uh, my guitar. So in post-production, it's going to sound beautiful because it's going right into the DAW through a reactive load box. And, uh, you know, being able to reference songs or, or riffs or solos or things like that is really something I want to incorporate into the show. And you can never clear the actual music these days without getting flagged. So, eh, there's no really, I mean, there's no really reason you need to do that. If you can play the riff uh, or, you know, maybe you want to play parts of your songs that have been copyrighted and, you know, you don't want to go through clearing the copyright, you just play the riff. Or, you know, you want to test out a, a new a new guitar or a new whatever. You're going to, you know, you want to promote those things. If you have a means to do that, I'd love to do that. I mean, I, like I said, I figured it out on my end. So um, yeah, I've got it. this I can show it. is edited. This show is, uh, you know, as candid as it, it possibly can be. And we will have guests. And Bill, I'm, I'm just happy to have you as a friend. Oh, uh, like I'm saying, we... Absolutely. Uh, we had we hadn't talked there for a couple of years, and I was kind of bumming because yeah. I knew it. You know, it would be a really good friendship. Absolutely. If we, you know, if we had some more uh, experiences together, so I'm so happy you're doing this with me, man. Oh, uh, dude, I, you know, I'm I'm not only excited to do this with you, but excited to to work on the documentary with you. Do it, like I said, like I told you on the phone call. Whatever you need, man, to make that documentary happen. You know, I, I'm there. Thanks. You know, I mean, well, I want. Go You'll ahead. be in it. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I was gonna I, say, I'd be honored, man. You know, honored to be in it. Um, you know, yeah. for me though, it's just I, I see the passion that you have. I mean, I saw the passion when we went to Prairie. I, dude, your eyes lit up like a kid in a candy store. You know, it yeah. was like I was like, it's my Disneyland. Absolutely, man. And, and Look, check it out. So my bro, my wife will go to Disneyland multiple times a year, and I could go once every twenty years because as as soon as I, you know, look, I, I rode the I rode those rides. I rode the ride. I'm good. Yeah. But Prairie Sun, you know, look, when I did the pre-interview with uh, Muka was on my show. It's been a couple of years now. My my uh, my podcast, the same one that you're all listening to. But and you can go back and listen to that. But I did a pre-interview with him uh, when I was sort of pitching him the idea of the documentary. And I said, look, if there's any like archival photos or you know, these stories need to come from you. This is your story. Tell your story of all the legendary things that have happened here on this rooster farm, chicken farm, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, that area is that area is very interesting because I don't know, what is it, 30 or 40 miles north of San Francisco proper? Yeah, about that. And you're in God's country. You see yeah. the curve of the earth from those mountains. Yeah. It's you're in the middle of nothing. When you pull I remember we pulled into the jack in the box because I wanted to get some food yeah. <laughs> and we're waiting for the chickens to get out of the way totally. so we go through the drive through yeah yeah <laughs> it's mean, just such a quirky little town it really is so uh i'm honored to do this documentary and i'm hoping you know i have enough footage to be able to put out a teaser right now of the tour that we took because they let me have access to whatever there's yeah. a john uh tom waits room yeah the Tom Waits, which room. is so yeah go ahead oh so real quick when when we just recorded in there and I put my amp in the Tom Waits room. Yeah. Never never had to touch. The, once I turned that amp on, plugged it in, shut the door, we didn't touch that amp one single time, touch the knobs. We didn't. Wow. All we did was turn it off and on in the, mor in the night, morning. That amp was never touched one single time. The, the, the sound in that room, dude. That's why Tom Waits loved that room so much. Yeah. There are so many, you know, really, even a lot of the consoles, you mentioned the Pete Townsend console, and, uh, you know, it is a world-class facility. I yeah. mean, it really is, and I know that there are some major bands, Metallica. What are some other names that you oh, can man. recall? I mean, I know all the shrapnel, but... Yeah, Journey, uh, Doobie Brothers, Santana, um, uh, the Killers were just there last year uh, recording their album, uh, Tom Waits, obviously... I mean, it I mean, it runs the gamut, man. I mean, yeah. you know, it runs the gamut. It, it, it truly is a legendary. It, what it is is it's a hidden gem, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, people always talk about Ocean Way. They talk about one on one. They talk about Sunset Sound. You know, all, all the all the uh, the the keywords, right? When you're referring to a studio, but it's the studios like Prairie Sun that that put out the stuff that you're like, wow, that's got character to it. 
Right. Well, the facility has character. You know, yeah. I remember when we walked in, some of it is, uh, you know, capture, you know, it's like sort of like frozen in time, but some of it is like so state of the art that, you know, it's, it's cutting edge, like of the day technology, like of the moment technology, uh, which is pretty amazing because you have certain rooms in there that have, like you said, the, the shrapnel room with, it has the stone wall that all those famous, it's exactly the same as it would have been in the mid to late eighties, exactly the same. Uh, the sounds of the rooms are exactly the same, you know, and the, the shapes of the room, everything about it is the same. And, uh, I love that. And I also love the fact that it's kind of like, uh, what, what's the word when they do that to, to, to old cars, they make them resto mods. Oh, where they like have brand new, you know, brand new engine, brand new chassis, brand new interior, yeah. but the outside of the car is of the time, you know? Yeah. It's still, and I just up. love that, man. I just, I love the history behind it. And I'm really excited for this documentary. I'm excited that you're doing this show with me, Bill. And uh, so we got to plan out the next show. You and I will get together and figure that out. But I want to thank you so much for doing this one. And I'm hoping that uh, this is an, uh, a new era. You know? Yeah, man, I- I'm, I'm in anytime you want. You know, this, this, this podcast here is probably my funnest one I've ever done. You know, uh, you know, awesome. a lot, you know, a lot of times you do a podcast, right? And it's just very stiff. It's, you know, cause you don't know the person you're doing the podcast with, right? They're interviewing you and you're like, you're just answering questions. Right. But we have a history, yeah. right? And there's that history and friendship and mutual respect as musicians and people, you know? So it's like, we can talk on a, on a more personal level. Well, you know, I, I think there's a, another layer to that. And it's this, there are people that I've had to talk to. Oh my God, it's going to sound like a real asshole when I say this, but <laughs> I can't wait for them to finish talking. Yeah. I, I'm, okay, I got it. I see who you are. I got it. I'm done. Then there, there are other people that when you start peeling back those layers, you're like, oh man, we could talk for hours. Oh, you easy. know, and it's like, it, it, you, you know, every experience is, uh, is going to have something interesting about it that you have a similarity with the other person. And there, you know, I, I feel like they're only a handful of people my entire life that I've wanted to talk to for more than an hour. And it's, you know, definitely uh, have a lot of respect for you. And, and, um, and, you know, look, looking forward to the next, the next episode. So uh, for sure, man, maybe we can get a guest next time. Maybe we can get Simon Phillips next time, which, hey, which would be amazing. Wouldn't so, that be amazing? Let me just tease, tease that at the end of this show here. And folks, thanks so much for tuning in. Bill, thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure, man. Absolutely. My and, pleasure. Uh, We'll catch you guys in the next one.